You got it? Okay. <clears throat> All right, we're, in Psalm, we're going to be in Psalm 42. In Psalm 42, um, <clears throat> some of the texts say that uh, this psalm um, really, the, uh, and in fact, <clears throat> the next couple of times we do this, we're going to do Psalms 42 and 43, and there's a lot of similarities between the two, okay? <clears throat> and um, uh, let me just read this here. Some, some texts suggest that these two psalms were written by David at the same time of his exile during Absalom's rebellion. And um, what I'm going to do is um, flip over here and just read, just so that you can get a little idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about Absalom's rebellion. Absalom was his son and uh, overthrew the king. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to be reading out of Second Samuel 14 and 15 a little bit. Uh, verse 25 says, um, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Okay, so this guy was foxy, okay. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> All right, and then uh, now I'm going to read in ver chapter 15, verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, which the gate is where people come in and out, and that's where they get judgment uh, from the elders. <clears throat> stood beside the way of the gate, and it was that when any man who had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy, see, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man uh, deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man who had any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And um, verse 5, And it was that when any man came near to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came uh, to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. All right, so let me go ahead and read just a few more verses here. <clears throat> But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gilanite and David's counselor from the city, even from Giloa, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with David. And then the last verse I'll read is verse 14. And David said unto all his her servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. All right. So what that does is it gives you <clears throat> a feeling of the situation that the, these two psalms were written under. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, let's, let me just read again. In exile, David had no access to the tabernacle or to Zion, which was David's tabernacle. In there, he had direct access to the ark. And there were musicians and singers and glorious worship continually. David had gotten used to that. He had set it up. His heart's desire was to be with God in God's heart's desire. All right. <clears throat> now, I want to get through a, a, a little bumpy part here because I want to communicate to you that the Old Testament and the way that they viewed God was very different than the way that we did. <clears throat> and uh, so if those that had scriptures, if you'll just come on up here and then I'll have you prepared to come to the microphone and read it. That way we can get it on the, on the tape for the other students and what have you. Okay. If you, you know, it might be good to get an order of how, how I called on you. I think, Mike, you were first, and Jim, and Mallory, and Shay, and then, and then I'll, I'll remember you. <clears throat> All right, let me read this, and then I'll have them come up with their scripture. Now, listen carefully, though, 
because what I'm going to share with you is a completely different view of kind of what we think David's heart is compared to what our heart is. When the psalmist spoke of seeing the Lord, it was based on what happened in the temple and not as we would use that phrase today. They saw him in festivals, sacrifices, the order of God. Okay, Psalm 68, verse 24 and 25. Your procession has come into view, O God, the procession of my God and King into the sanctuary. In front are the singers, after them the musicians, with them are the maidens playing tambourines. Okay. And also the ark was carried around, and, <clears throat> and uh, when the ark would come, they would say, look, here comes the Lord. Okay, and uh, Jim, if you read the... One thing I have desired of the Lord that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David made no distinction between the beauty of the Lord and the acts of worship ordained of God in the temple. Are you all sort of following what I'm saying here? This is all related to temple worship. This is not related to charismatic worship. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, the rituals and the vision of God were the same because Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. You see how that works? When they saw the Lord, folks, they saw the Lord in all of these things that, that were going on with the ark and the festivals and the, the feasts and the, the offerings. And that's where they saw the Lord. That was the Lord that they saw. They weren't, you know, just like having a vision of God in the sense of, you know, Jesus appeared at the foot of my bed or something. Um, uh, let's see, who's Psalm 50, verse 2? Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. God is shining forth. We're, we're just seeing God shine forth somewhere. We're just, you understand what I'm saying? We're just sort of, they had a completely different thing. Everything that they knew of God was connected to what God set up. Okay? Uh, in between festivals, they were like parched ground. If you read uh, 63, 1 and 2. O God, thou art my God, I shall seek thee earnestly. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh yearns for thee in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have beheld thee in the sanctuary to see thy power and thy glory. Gosh, Shay's a good reader. I'd like to just like have him here, and every time I came to a scripture, I'd just step up and he'd read the scripture. I'd be like, oh man, that's, that was good. <laughs> um, so, uh, so he's, he's saying, you know, I want to see you. I want to experience you. I'm thirsty. I'm, I'm in between festivals. I'm in between feasts. You see that? All right. Um, only there can they be at ease as a bird in a nest. Uh, let's see, am I reading the right one? No. They wanted to be satisfied with the pleasures of his house. Psalm 65, verse 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. You see how that, they're, they're relating their relation with God totally in the temple or in those things that, that God had set up. That's where they see God. That's how they know God. That's how they experience God. Okay, and then uh, Psalm 84, 1 one through three, and then also go ahead and read verse 10. Okay. Now amiable are they t are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may, be, may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. And then verse 10. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand 
I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tent of the wickedness. So, are you getting the point? I mean, you, you listen to that, and you realize their relation, they weren't, there wasn't some sort of charismatic relationship where you floated. You understand what I'm saying? That you floated around. Man, when they saw the Lord, they saw the Lord high and lifted up in this train filled the temple, or they saw, you know, they saw, and what was that? That wasn't a vision, folks. That was a, live, that was a reality of what those things represented. They began to, but they always understood God in terms of temple worship and the way that things were ordered of God, and that was the God that they knew. All right, so let me finish reading this. The Psalms are full of praise and worship based on what is revealed in the feast and temple and is not just general joy over God. The picture that God wants us to get of himself is from the law and from the temple. And here's what I mean. Folks, Jesus came to fulfill the law. He didn't just come and start a new religion. Do you understand that? Everything is a fulfillment of something that was before. And if we don't understand what's before, then we don't really know what he fulfilled. It's, it's like he's starting a new religion. Yes. Right. 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 Now remember, of course, these people, this is the old covenant, and we're getting scriptures like what we got uh, from this. Uh, these people had far less reason for loving God than we. Amen. They did not have eternal life, but they, ex in the sense of Christ being eternal life, being our life. <clears throat> but they expressed a longing after him. They discovered the truth and the beauty of the Lord in the festivals and rituals. They did not feel the presence of the Lord as we do or just enjoy a church service. But they, continually, they were continually confronted with the Lamb, with the living reality of these things, uh, of the Lord through those things. Okay, now we always think, you know, the way David talks, you know, it's like, whoo, I just experienced the Lord in some way. Well, he did, but watch his words. Watch the words. They're always in relationship to these feasts or something like that. They're always in relationship to better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. You see, it's, that's where the reality of God came to them. Um, when in ca captivity, Israel lost temple worship. Remember, they were taken into captivity and they lost the temple. The temple was torn down. They lost temple worship. Um, to compensate, they set up synagogues. Now, let me tell you, a synagogue was nothing like the temple. All right? The custom of church today is more like what a synagogue used to be like. They were meeting in houses or in different locations where the law was read, but the temple was the place of sacrifice, the true essential worship. It was the true essential worship. Without the temple, Israel was without its true meaning and purpose. Nowadays, people enjoy a beautiful service, but true worship is not there without sacrifice, without the lamb being presented to God. As Christians, our life begins with baptism into death. Amen? Our, our most sacred time together centers on the broken body and shed blood. Broken body, shed The lamb, still, even after we're saved, it's still centered on us taking that, that one who died into ourselves so that we have that same life at work within us. The cross was made to be central even, let's see. Yeah, the cross was made to be central even as the altar was central to them. Okay, all right, so this all is important and it was important for me to go over because this psalm is based on this and this psalm, but, the, but it's based on the fact that David was king in Israel and he had Zion in his backyard. He had David's tabernacle and the ark in his backyard, folks, and so now Absalom comes in 
and takes over, and him and the men that are with him leave, and they go across the Jordan. Okay, and you can read all about this in, in uh, 2 Samuel 14, 15, 16. And they leave, and they go across the Jordan, and there David begins to cry out in Psalm 42 and begins to uh, want the Lord, but you have to see the basis upon which he's crying and the Lord that he misses and the Lord that he really wants, okay? So let's uh, read, uh, let's go ahead and read Psalm 42. As the deer panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Now listen to this. He is away from God in the sense that the, the ark of the covenant and the temple, as it were, the habitation, is in Jerusalem, and he's away from God. The God that he knows, the God that quote unquote appears to him, if you will. Okay? So he says, you know, I am, my soul is panting after God. My, verse 2, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You see that? Because he's away from the, all, the ark that he could just walk into. When am I going to be able to come and appear? Not when is God going to appear to me. You see, anybody see the difference? Big difference, okay? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Because now David doesn't have God with him. He's in Jerusalem, okay? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. Do you see it? He's relating God in all of these things, and that's what he's longing for. Okay? Um, verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquiet in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan. Where did, where did it say in Samuel that he ended up going? He crossed the Jordan. He had to cross and go out of the land, okay? And of the Hermans from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the nighttime his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. <clears throat> All right. So um, his heart's desire to be with God was to be back in Jerusalem, to be in Zion, and to be able to uh, be with the Lord there. <clears throat> um, because we went long, and I don't want to just drag this, I mean, if we took this a whole hour, I'm afraid that we would, uh, uh, you know, be real late. So I'm going to try to read some. Some, uh, it is interesting to see that his longing was not for the throne. Now, this was King David. King David was driven out from his kingdom and from his throne. But his longing is not for the throne or for his position as king or for the return of his kingdom, but only for access to the Lord. That's what David missed was Zion. He did not yearn for the comfort of his own house, but God's house. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was cut off from direct access. He was heart sick over this. The presence of the Lord was an urgent need of his soul. And when we say the presence of the Lord, remember how we, it was like water to a deer. I've got to get back to where the Lord is. This is no luxury, but one of survival to David. Maybe a luxury to us. But to David, this, I must get to the Lord. I'm like a deer dying of thirst. <laughs> Uh, the extreme thirst demonstrates his extreme need for the living God. All right, and then uh, two, uh, 
the last part of two, well, let's just, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? David is rejected, not just by enemies, but by his son and by trusted counselors. But his only concern is when he gets to come back and appear before God again. Shall I never make my pilgrimage into the presence of God because I'm cast out from Jerusalem? And then in verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? He feels the sting of those who in the present circumstance make it look as if God is no longer with him. But it reminds him that he does not have God in the way of the tabernacle and feast right now. And that's what hurts him the most. Not just that they're mocking him but that he doesn't have the Lord in that way. And they're using that occasion to say, see, is God with him? Um, Their words are only a reminder that he doesn't have that access like he used to. And verse 4, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude of them that kept holy day. He longs for things to be as he remembers joy as the whole congregation goes up and celebrates the feast. He misses the Lord. (laughs) I just want to be with the Lord. And he knows that he's he's in exile and that they'll kill him if he comes back. But all he can think about all he can I mean can you imagine you're driven out from your family you're driven out from your kingdom you're driven out from your home you're driven out from all this stuff and all he can think about is I want to be with the Lord now an interesting thing was is that the the priest when he was leaving and getting out of there before Absalom totally took over and killed everybody that was on his side the priest came out and met David with the ark and said in in uh, some of the modern translations it says something like dude this belongs to you <laughs> this this ark you're the one who always watched out for the ark you're the one who took care of it he said no 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 i can't i can't take the ark from its home i may be driven from my home but i can't take the ark from its home i've spent my whole life to get the ark to its home and send it back and maybe god will have mercy upon me and bring me back to him what a heart what a what a precious precious incredible heart and and of course when he said no let god have his habitation even if i don't have mine that became the occasion for enemies to say where's god god's not with you but david's heart was Look, I don't care what they say. In light of the greater issue, God wants a habitation. And if everybody thinks bad of me because I don't go ahead and take the ark with me, which he considered to be selfish if he did that, he said, no. God wanted a habitation. I brought him to Zion, and I'm not taking him out of Zion. God's going to have to bring me back to Zion. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. That really is. Um, so... Verse uh, 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of what? His countenance. The kind of help that David wants is not for his enemy's mouth to be shut, but the help that comes to David by seeing the face of the Lord. Then he is changed into that same image. Then his soul will be quieted. Because isn't that what he said? My soul is... Why are you cast, my soul's cast down, it's disquieted. I'm looking for the help of thy countenance. Is that not what I just read there? That is exactly what he's saying is the real answer that he's looking for there. Okay, in verse 6, O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee, will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermans from the hill of Mizar. His soul is cast down in him. Therefore, David will remember the Lord from the far off place that he's been required to resort to. Uh, I wrote, in my sad mood, I will think of you here in this land of Jordan and of Hermon. And he goes, he carries that on in verse 7 and probably 8. 
The deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will we'll do seven and eight. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. Um, these, these emotional waves have gone over David, verse 7, but when things were good, meaning in the daytime, David experienced his loving kindness. Even so, in the nighttime, in the nighttime, when things are dark, his songs will be, his songs will be with me, and my prayers will be with him. In other words, he's in a place where he can't come into that habitation. He can't walk in and, and worship God at the ark, which is, which is almost a completely David thing. I mean, only the high priest could do that once a year. David went in continually before the Lord and wasn't even of the tribe of Levi. But now he's, he's in a situation. What is it? It's a situation. It's not who David is. It's not who the ark is. It's not the way God ordered the inside of David, but it's a situation. And so David says, well, even though I can't be with you, even though I can't, enter in at this time know this Lord your songs are going to be in me even in this far off land and my prayers are going to be with you even in this far off land folks you don't have to be totally defeated you don't have to just because the circumstances have turned that way the Lord hadn't the Lord is with you and the Lord wants to communicate the oneness that is in his heart when he drew you and not and not and drew you and saved you and then made you one with him and then declared you to be his bride and declared you to be his body and declared you to be his temple and and all of that doesn't change because circumstances have put you outside of that that's still true and it, it and you know in God's heart David was still a man after his heart. And, and these circumstances only showed that more. If he wasn't a man after God's heart, these circumstances, he'd have given up. or he'd have, This would have been nothing but a big gripe about what his enemies did to him. But David, and I, I, believe, I believe that that, that jewel that called David shines even brighter in this terrible situation that he's in. I mean, he's, he's dying of thirst for the Lord because he's separated, but he's shining brighter to the Lord. You know, we look, somebody looks, Absalom looks, Shemaiah looks, all these people who are wanting David's downfall, they look and they go, hey, God's not with him. Don't you people see that? If God was, with, if God was really with him, the ark would be with him right now. They don't know what they're saying. They don't even know the background of the whole thing. They don't know the heart of the whole thing. But David has to remember that, and you have to remember it. You have to remember it. It's good to talk about this stuff. It's good to preach this stuff. It's great. But it doesn't mean anything until we're in a far-off land, as it were, feeling separate and everything else. And we have to remember his heart for us because he remembers our heart for him. We have to remember that he made, he didn't just save us. He didn't just, you know, call us out of bad circumstances. He married us, made us his bride. He joined with us, made us his body. He, he came into us and inhabits us and made us his habitation, his temple. And that's the way he sees it. That's eternal. That'll never change. Feelings will change. Circumstances will change. Reality as God knows it doesn't change. And the sooner we line up, you know, that's why, that's why David, David admits, I'm having trouble with this. But he's saying, why, not why God, why soul? <laughs> why are you cast, why are you disquieted in me? Why are you going through all this? Why are you depressed? Why are you down? Why don't, where's your hope in God? Where's your trust in what God has done? Where is it? Where, where is the place of faith? This is the place of faith. You don't need faith when you're dancing around inside the tabernacle. You, know, you don't need faith. You, you got everything there. You need faith 
when you don't have that feeling and that access and everything. And, but God's saying, believe it. Stand on it. I said it's true. Do you believe me? We say, well, yeah, but, you know. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we read, uh, let's read 9. I will say unto, unto God, my rock. See, he didn't, say, he didn't say, I will say unto God, almighty God. He said, I'll say to God, my rock, my God, my rock, my Jesus. Not Jesus in general. I pray to the, 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 what is the word for the medicine that's, I pray for the, to the generic Jesus. God, oh God, my Jesus, my God, my rock, you're my rock. Yeah, this is, this is where faith counts. Believe in generalities don't, won't help you in this kind of a situation. Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And now in this one, he, he starts talking about the enemy, okay? As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? So who God is to David? In this psalm, he says, my rock, my life. These are the only two verses where David really mentions the hurt an effect of the enemy upon him. Okay. We, I don't know that we'll ever get to a place where there's never any hurt or effect of the enemy on us. But I will say this. If you're ever going to be a vessel that God can use long term, long term, you can't harbor resentments over anything and anybody. You can't do it. You can't do it. You've got to give it up. You restrict yourself. And the more you hold things against people, unforgivenesses and resentments, the, the more confined the space is. And then I've seen people in that situation, and then they'll say, well, why, God, why won't God open doors for me? Why won't God do, you know, I mean, it's like he doesn't, you know, even bless me, you know. And when I do something, then he doesn't bless that and everything. Folks, you, you, can't, you can't harbor all that stuff. You can't let it eat you alive. If you do, you're, you're not, he may love the heck out of you, but he can't use you. <laughs> it's the only way I know how to put it. He can't use you. And, but, but when, you know, and, and what is the, the phrase I used to use a long time on? Keep short accounts. Keep short accounts. If you're keeping account, keep short ones. <laughs> you know, don't just, because, because I, and I know, I know from experience, folks, these things can eat you alive. They can eat you alive. I mean, if, I mean, if you have a heart like David that really wants the Lord and somebody starts doing stuff to separate you from the Lord and from the Lord you love, if you understand it, we're just using this example with David, that hurts. <laughs> and, and then they're slandering him by saying, you know, where is his God? And they said that twice in this thing, so apparently that hit home with David because I think David... Uh, this is a bad, bad terminology, but I think he prided himself on being with the Lord and the Lord being with him. And I don't blame him because he really was. But uh, it's, uh, you, may, you may wrestle for a long time with stuff, but you've got to win the battle eventually. You've got to win the battle eventually. And, you know, a lot, to be honest with you, a lot of times the herd and all the stuff that we're going through is nothing more than pride over how they made us look or how they made us feel. Or I mean, I'm speaking from my experience anyway, and maybe I don't know everybody's experience. But a lot of time it's just pride and stuff like that. And there is this amazing reality that the help of his countenance, which David spoke of, just, you, you just don't care. You get to a place... It takes a while, <laughs> but folks, you got to look into his face for a while. 
It doesn't just automatically come because you're a Christian. You've got to want to, and, and it's not just, I want to look into your face so I, I'm because I'm tired of hurting. Anybody ever said that? I'm tired of hurting. Lord, reveal yourself to me. I think that's sort of a wrong motivation, you know. You say, Lord, I just want to see you. You know, I just, I'm tired of wrestling with this, but, I, but more important, you know, it's like the unstable earth. But I want to go to higher ground. And so you choose to just be with the Lord and to see the Lord. And, and with time, then, the health and the help of his countenance, and David used both phrases, the help and the health of his countenance in different psalms. Uh, does what nothing else will do. And then it's like, I mean, it can actually become, and not, not your whole life, but if you pursue the Lord because you want the Lord long term and that's more important than fixing the situation, then it can become like water off a duck's back. But only because of Christ, strictly and completely, and he'll get all the glory because you'll know this is not me. This is Christ in me. This is my rock, my life. And, and thank God, thank God. Uh, okay, and then, uh, well, let's close with verse 11 then. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Now, this is the second time to bring that up. Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. There it is. Who is the health? It is in both of these scriptures. Who is the health? of my countenance and my God. Um, you know, there's some people that just can't hide, hide it when they're down. They just ooze depression or something. You know, they just, you know, it's, it's like, I, I've known people like this where when they walk in a room, there's a cloud over them and, and everyone is affected by the cloud. It's like, you know, oh, Lord, what is this, you know? <laughs> and um, their countenance is just a dead giveaway for where they're at. And then a lot of times that same person, when they're doing good, their countenance is a giveaway again. They just glow, you know. Yay! <clears throat> well, his countenance is the health of our countenance. When we see him, we are changed. People always say, I want to change, Lord. I want to change. The Bible, the only place I see where it clearly just says this is the change is either the cross or looking into his face and being changed into his image. But that will only happen because you're looking at him and saying, I love you. I, lo I am beholding the beauty of the Lord, and I want that worked into me. And you do that on the basis of being bride, body, one. You, you don't do that on the basis of anointing or calling or sp I'm special or I'm not special, you know. You do, you know. you do that on the basis of he said I'm one, you know. You said that, Lord. I mean, I've had to say that stuff to him like that. You, you're the one who, you know, the, like the scripture says, when the, it pleased the Father to reveal his Son in me. And, you know, I, you know, I know God has begun the process of revealing his son in me. And I'd say, you're the one who said I'm a son. You're the one who sent forth the spirit of your son into my heart, crying, Abba, Father. I need a fresh look. I need to see your face because we're one. You made us one. I didn't make us one. If I was in control, I wouldn't be one. I'd already run off. But you did this, it was in your heart, and I'm sticking with your heart. Amen. You know. And so he says, so I ain't going by my soul. It's cast down. It's disquieted in me. I ain't going by that. I'm rebuking it. <laughs> you know, we usually don't rebuke it. We go, God, fix, fix my soul, you know. When he wants faith to rise in your spirit and to turn to your soul and say, shut up. 
you know. But we're always wanting God to do that. You know, God to come down and go, you know, two people, separate. And the one that's the mighty one says, shut up. Yes, Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's what we wanted an altar. Folks, what he'd really like is there to be an altar within us, the cross at work within us, where we acknowledge the true altar, which is the cross. And we say, that whiny soul is dead, and I'm alive in you, and you are the health of my countenance. Fill this vessel with your life. And he'll do it, but, but there has to be faith in that union. It's not just words. You don't just say this stuff. This is the doctrine we teach here, so let's just say it and hope for the best. No. No, 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 no. And, and you know, no, no one person can bring that to you. Somewhere the ear has to catch something of the Lord in these things and say, my God, you know, I, it's the same thing with healing. You know, I mean, many of us have exercised faith in terms of healing. And we'd say, well, you know, you'd read the Bible and you'd say, well, Jesus healed that woman with the issue of blood. And he's no respecter of persons, so he'll heal me. So, Lord, anybody ever experienced faith like that? I have. Well, folks, it's the same thing, except David called him my Lord, my God, my life. I mean, that's... That's just beautiful. And you say, you know, Lord, you are, you know, I'm not going by my soul. You are my life. You are the vine, and I'm a branch, and I totally believe that. And your life, you know, and in one sense, you don't even say, let your life flow into me because you are a branch. You say, your life is in me, and I'm just simply going to acknowledge it. And you'd be surprised. If you truly acknowledge it in faith. But again, I want to warn you against thinking that because this Bible school or this church teaches a certain doctrine, that it's going to automatically come to you. Folks, it comes to the hungry. It comes to the soul that seeks the Lord. That's what we saw in that last song. It comes to those that, that really, really want the Lord in a real way. David said, I seek, the, I seek the, my God, the living God. You know? And, bef and there was David, but before David, there was, you know, who? There was Samuel, who really, really found the Lord. And then before him, there was, you know, we go back to Joseph, and we go to Noah, and we go to Moses, and we go to, you know, whatever the order is. But we find people that really found the Lord, and they weren't just playing at it, and they didn't just have religion and doctrine and stuff. They really, really found the Lord. And I say that God is no respecter of persons. And he'll do that for anybody, but your heart has to get up, you know. It, it's kind of like uh, we're couch potatoes in our heart, <laughs> you know. We need to get up from the, you know, our heart is more like a, 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 a lazy boy. We're just laid back and we need to get up and go after the Lord in faith and in believing him. So... David sees that just as his soul was the problem in relation to being separate from the Lord, so his soul is the real problem concerning his enemies. Because the first time he used this about his soul, it was about being separate from the Lord. Now he's, talking, he's been talking about his enemies. He knows he needs a change in his soul and not just a change in his circumstances. But not just soul improvements. For David says, it is him who is the health of my countenance. We are not to remain cast down, but to take action and use faith. And so um, that, that little last line, I think, is just real important. People aren't always going to be around you to lift you up. I believe in the body of Christ. I do, folks. But I'm going to tell you something right now, and, and, you know, the whole world doesn't like me anyway, so, you know, I'll say it anyway. But... The body of Christ, the way it has formed up, has just been like some sort of a, a, a recovery group where everybody just, you know, rushes to the aid and go, oh, you know, you need a hug, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and it's almost like we're making cripples out of everybody where nobody knows how to just go. Like, you remember David when, 
I mean, my God, he's, he's, all, he's, he's cast out from Saul. He's cast out from his country. He's on the run. So all these people come join to him. You know, nothing compared to what it what was before, but, you know, a certain amount of people come join to him. And then they go out on a campaign, and when they come back, the enemy has come at Ziglag and, you know, attacked the camp when it was nothing but, you know, women and children and stuff, taken all the women and children captive, taken all their goods and left, and all the people get upset with David. And they all turn on him like he did it. And you know what the scripture says? There wasn't anybody, there, there, you know, there wasn't Joab, there wasn't, you know, any of those people sitting there going, well, you know, da-da-da-da, this and that. It says, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And I believe that if we don't watch it, we're going to become cripples and we'll never, you know, we say, well, I got to have, well, you know, yeah, some people do. But some people are supposed to get to a place where we say, I am with you, Lord. I, I shall, you know, well, I shall not be. You know, we should say, well, we shall not be. Because, you know, uh, somebody's bound to be up. Well, then quit singing, I shall not be. Because I shall not be moved. Says, if nobody else comes to me, if nobody else knows how to pray, If nobody else, because, uh, folks, a lot of times when people come to you, they don't pray the right thing. They pray what you want to hear or what, you know, or they want to sound spiritual or something. You know, you don't, you fairly say, you know, people come forward, you know, I, I, I've told this story before, but a guy used to, to, to uh, want deliverance from cigarettes, uh, came to our church when we were on Bolivar and, and uh, he, he just said, you know, one day he came up and said, Randy, pray for me. I just, I just feel like I, I need to quit smoking. I said, well, sure, that's up to you. That's between you and God, but I'll pray for you. So I prayed for him. Two weeks later, he came to the altar. Randy, would you pray for me? I just feel like I need to quit smoking, you know, and, and uh, you know, which I don't, whether you do or don't, doesn't matter. What matters is he felt like he, it was the Lord, you know. This went on, folks, for over a year. Almost every altar call, he came up, would you pray for me? I mean, where, at one point, you just go, my God, in the name of Jesus, you know. So finally, he, you know, finally one day he came forward, and I went, oh, no, I know what he's going to, you know. So he, he stood there and said, would you pray for me? I said, sure. I said, Father, if he ever touched another cigarette, kill him. Well, what he said, no, I don't agree with that. He didn't want to quit. You, you understand what I mean. You, you know. And, and I've told that story, and I've had people hold on for years later and say, what a horrible pastor you were to pray something like that. <laughs> Folks, I didn't, I, first of all, I didn't really mean kill him. I, I was trying to shake him up, okay? God knows that I wasn't asking him to die the next time he tucks a cigarette. <laughs> That person didn't understand that because they don't know my heart and they don't know what's really going on. They just hear words and whatever. But anyway, nonetheless, uh, you know, we have to get some gumption toward our, it has to be our God. It can't be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, you know, Isaac called him for the longest, the God of Abraham. Eventually, he became the God of Abraham and Isaac. Jacob called him the, Abraham, the God of Abraham and Isaac, but eventually he became the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That means each one of them got on their feet and went after the Lord. Yes. Got a hand up? Amen. Amen. Well, let me close this so I, I shut up. But let me just close with, like I do a lot of my sharings, with a disclaimer. And that is, folks, I know we need the body. I know that some people are, are young and, and not able to stand on their feet, and, and they need other people to pray. And I would hope that we're doing that to some degree here. I mean, I would hope that, I would hope, 
that I could look around this room and see certain people that I know regularly go to people and help and pray and stuff like that. Um, when people come forward, you know, I mean, if, if, if I'm doing the altar call, man, I want them to get the Lord, and I want to be able to stand in the gap and, you know, what, what is it, make up the hedge, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking of something I heard recently about a guy going, my hedge ain't much, you know. You, I'll make, you know, stand in there and put a hedge there, and the devil, oh, it's a hedge. <clears throat> anyway, sorry. <laughs> oh no! How am I going to, you know, how am I going to deal with that? You know. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I know. God help me. I, you know, no wonder I'm in so much trouble. I, I asked for it. Father, I just ask you to help, help us, Lord. Help our hearts to be after you. Lord, you, you will take care of us under all circumstances, at every stage of our walk. You, you are Father. You are Father. And, and I trust you in every phase for every person because this isn't out of your hands ever. So, Lord, I just ask you to continually open our eyes more and more to you in different ways. Lord, if we lean too heavily on making a stand for you, then let us be more compassionate. Lord, if we're, if we're just so compassionate, we're so, Lord, so full of sloppy agape that no one really gets help, then, Lord, help us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind instead of just trying to get hold of somebody. And Lord, I just see on TV and evangelists how they make people dependent upon them when, Lord, truly we need to have our first dependency upon you. So, Father, I just pray that you'll order this according to your heart. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.